hello everybody. This is Amy News in Conversation. I'm Brian and I'm here today with two exciting guests. Um, and we're going to be talking about natural disasters and how that might impact the uh, sterile processing department and how they how they get things done. Uh, before we do any of that, though, let's first introduce ourselves. So I'll, I'll start with you, Damien. Sure. Uh, my name is Damien Berg. I'm the Vice President of uh, Strategic Initiatives for HSPA, Healthcare Sterile Processing Association. And I've been serving on the AME Committee since uh, 2006, 2007. So I co-chaired several documents, and I participate in majority of the documents. Uh, so I really do enjoy bringing not only the end user's perspe perspective as a uh, manager, director, trainer, technician for 29, 30 years, mm -hmm. but also as now uh, one of the leaders for our association. Awesome. Uh, Tim Hurtado from Memorial Hermann. Um, we're a pretty large system here in Houston, or there in Houston, um, a 12 hospital system. Uh, I've been AME for about ooh, three years, I think. Oh, wow. um, so I'm, I'm still young in this, but have been participating in a lot of the standards and publications. And I mean, I, I love this and being able to contribute. And you know, that's what we really love to see is when somebody's new to the standards process, they're here during Sterilization Standards Week, because this is the time where you get to know everybody and be really involved in the process of your committees and, and what have Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, the FDA recently rolled out some recommendations for how to respond to a natural disaster uh, if it's going to be impacting your health system. And one of the big concerns that I saw within those recommendations was water quality. What can go wrong there? So uh, obviously water is pretty critical for, for our areas, uh, you know, for our steam, uh, for our washers, our sinks. And um, out in, in the Houston area, we have uh, multiple uh, opportunities for disasters to occur, mm -hmm. hurricanes, um, flooding, which can contaminate our um, water lines, as well as our busted pipelines as well. Those all can result in contaminated water. And if we, if we had, don't have any contingency plans in place, our sterile processing is shut down, and that is huge. So, you know, a small disaster, uh, bust a pipeline, we could fix it a couple hours. Okay, we can get by that. But when we have major uh, uh, disasters such as a hurricane and we're flooded and have weeks of downtime, that's when we're, we're concerned because now we can't provide for the community. No, great examples right there. And I think, you know, when we look at disasters, there's so many different types of disasters. There's yeah. natural disasters, there's man-made disasters, and there's honestly facility-owned disasters <laughs> where things just happen and your facility shuts down. And what I could say, if I've experienced everything of like just sterile processing, make it happen. How long, you know, how many instruments do you have before we run out? You can't process, but how can we keep going? Mm -hmm. Two, I've been part of a healthcare system that we had a disaster and we were out of water and out of steam and we had a big meeting with all the leadership and everybody went around and says, can we keep going? And mother and family OB goes, we're good. ER, ER goes, we're good. Everybody around the room goes, we're good, we're good, we're good. Came to me and I said, we're not good. I can't sterilize. And then mother and family goes, we're no longer good. ED <laughs> goes, we're no longer good. But it's having that relationship where everybody understands the importance of sterile processing and when these things impact, because they may not impact they don't impact every department the same way. So having the leadership recognize that sterile processing, when those things happen, especially around water, because they think water is water is water, mm -hmm. and it's not when we process medical devices. So the sad the thing that I never want to do is reprocess something inappropriately with contaminated water or whatever, and sitting on a shelf, we think it's sterile, and it's a ticking time bomb later on. That Absolutely. is going to get used a week, two weeks, a month later. Uh, plus just the workload. It's just a... a daunting that's what the staff have to do sometimes yeah i think uh with that you know it's the end all um, i think hospitals and health systems need to have a contingency that's actually part of their policy or procedure mm. um and being prepared for that um i know down south in in, in my, my region area you know we have um, uh, sustainable uh, water ready to go in tanks um wow. that we manage and make make sure so that way if our system goes down we can use what we call potable water at that point uh, to continue reprocessing. Um, again, looking at wh where you're at and looking at your water and, and how that affects, I think that's where you need to decide what contingencies, because what I do uh, in my area may not apply for someone in California or someone in New York. So I think it's important for uh, executives and, and sterile processing leaders to have that contingency and have the staff know what that contingency is. That's fascinating, too, because when I think of natural disaster preparedness or, or any disaster preparedness, most hospitals, I would imagine, yeah, you got a backup generator. 
I've never thought about, do you have a backup tank of water? Absolutely. Right. And it's a perishable item. It's it's not something you just fill a tank and <laughs> you use it five years later. Oh, like correct. That. So, and in Colorado, which I know is not Texas, but we everybody's got unique uh, disasters where we don't necessarily have the um, weather that they have. But we had, for instance, last year, I think it was the year before last, we had uh, just tr- horrendous fires, mm. forest fires. Yeah. And it was called something called the burn scar. It got so hot so long that it burnt the soil. Well, then when we do have rain and snow pack and it runs off, even like six months after the fire, the water table is contaminated with this black soot. And so then that goes into our water and we get a lot of waters from just the open uh, lakes. Mm. And so then that caused problems with the sterilizers, caused problems with the actually central utility plant. And we did have to go to Blivets, but tanks, you know, plastic tanks or uh, bags of water to feed the hospital so it's not like it's feeding directly into sterile processing for the size depends on the size of the facility but you got to kind of think it's something happened and then six months later is the disaster actually because it burnt but we didn't have the runoff till six months later so you got to have those plans in place and 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 worry about all that stuff it was actually a double dip for a hospital they had to shut down because of the ash in the air hitting the air filters yeah and we couldn't filter our air and then we had to reclean everything, and then six months later we had to shut down again oh, because of the water, water quality, because of the runoff. So disasters just continue sometimes to hit no matter where you're at in the country. We're talking about water quality. Uh, I know both of you are involved in uh, one of our committees that's all about water quality, uh, and it was a recent document that just came out, uh, ST-108, for uh, reprocessing of medical devices. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Does that document touch on this issue? Yeah, that's the, you, I don't want to call it unique, but the, the nice part of the benefit of this document. So Amy's had a document for many years, TIR uh, 34, which mm. was water quality for reprocessing of medical devices. But the TIR really just gave some guidance because it was, we're studying it and we're kind of learning it. And that's what a TIR is for. It's like an evolving technology, evolving science, evolving whatever. And for those who don't know, this is a technical information report. Correct. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I speak Amy for some time, <laughs> so I've got to learn how to translate. Um, then it went into ST, which stands for standard, yeah. uh, 108, because we had enough data, we had enough experience now, not only as end users, but also industry folks, the manufacturers of the washers and the medical devices, as well as our scientists, our PhDs, the really smart mm-hmm. folks that understand water and how to do it. So got it all together. But what this document, when it went from the TIR 34 to the ST 108, we added more robust language in there to cover things like disasters, to cover things like water outages, construction, natural disasters, boil alerts, all that fun stuff. It's We added more stuff to there that wasn't in the TIR to give the end users valuable information. Right, and users like you. Correct, and I agree. I think uh, that uh, ST-108 is very important um, because water quality um, for anything, for your steam sterilization, for your washers, um, if you don't have that that uh, clean water, utility water, critical water, you're going to see degradation of your equipment quickly. And, you know, places with hard water, um, I've seen in many places to where uh, it has clogged uh, up our systems and um, has caused failures in equipment that's only two, three years old. Mm. So... Tim does a great point right there. So, and, and rightfully so, we do focus on the patient. Always patients at the f- foremost of our, right. our thoughts and our minds and our processing. But there could be instances where the water quality is to a point where it's not harmful for the patient, but it, it does impact the inventory and the fleet that we have of instruments, very expensive stuff, and our equipment, which then, if we don't have the instruments and we don't have the equipment, then you jeopardize patients. patient care. Yeah. So. I think uh, one of the critical parts that I saw on the ST-108, which we didn't have before, and we ran into the issues like this um, when we had boil alerts, is what do you do after a boil alert? Uh. How do you treat your water treatment system? Um, and in ST-108, it, it does explain, you know, the proper methods of disinfecting your, your RO tank and what you do with your filters. So that right there, I think, was huge because we did figure it out and how to do it, but it took a while. Yeah. Now the end users, now the facilities have that at their hands. No, I think that's spot on because realistically, in, in a lot of departments, especially in a big natural disaster, I mean, they shut down. I mean, surgery stopped because except for urgent, emergent, and we have a fleet of inf- instruments that can do it. And we can kind of backlog our work, and then once the water comes back up, we'll catch back up to the work. But it's to the point, is the water ready at that point? So now we have Correct. water 
but is it ready? Right. And so that's where the document comes in and says, okay, these are the steps you need to do to make sure your water's ready. And then, it, it, again, it also gets you to ask other questions that maybe you weren't thinking about, like how, much, how many gallons do I actually need per washer? How many mm. do I need per cycle? How many do I need per this? Because that will help you come up with your equation on how much water you need in your tank or your blivet or whatever else, which you wouldn't have thought about it unless you, that document kind of guides you down that path. One of the big things also besides all that that 108 T, ST108 added was giving sterile processing people a, a voice at the table. So there's a section in there about responsibilities and communication. Mm. So before, you know, we'd never really had a say in water management. It just was, we provide you water, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. Now, so we, according to this document, you have a seat at the table. And you know what to say. You know who should be at the table. So when you have these conversations, or when city water changes, sometimes there's disasters, like he said, when a pipe breaks in the city, the plant may know, but we'll never know. Now Correct. we're at the table. Now we'll know. We can go, whoa, that does impact me. So those are the kind of things that in ST-108 covers that never has been covered before. And, you know, that calls back to that situation you were talking about before where everyone's saying, yes, my department's ready to go again until they heard from you. And then they realized, oh, wait, none of us can go do our jobs. Yeah. And I've said this before somewhere. I don't remember where, but it's not my quote. Um, but I love the quote. And it's, this is why you have to have a seat at the table, because if you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu. <laughs> and so I just like that quote because bottom line is it's still processing. Think we're just behind the red line. You need to get out beyond the red line and work with other departments and leaders so they know who you are and what you do. Have pride in that. And and we do. But it's this document gives you just a little more extra oomph of why because now you got it on in writing to show your executives, to show the facilities managers, show periop leadership that we are part of the leadership team that help make decisions for the patient. Yeah. You know, what, I'll I'll take that moment. I'd be remiss not to, but for any of our members who are not at that table right now, but are in a sterile, you know, sterile processing department or saying, hey, this impacts me, contact standards at amy.org and we'll connect you with the right committees. Yeah, and get the document. I think that's the number one <laughs> right thing on I can tell you. Because yeah. I get a lot, I, obviously I get a lot, and Tim does too, we get a lot of calls or emails or messages saying, I hear this, one of it's what's in it? Get the document. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's one of those things where you can't just get it through osmosis or give you cliff notes of it. You need to get it and read it and figure out what your response is. You don't need to be an expert in water quality. Right. I'm not an expert in water quality as far as all the numbers. That's why there's smart people in these rooms making help with the document. It's how I can implement it and how the humans, the technicians work with it. That's where we come in when we sit in the meeting rooms helping design these and develop these, these uh, standards and TIRs. There is an importance there, too, you know, having end users like you guys at the table to kind of help towards making these documents digestive in such a way where you're coming up with your emergency plan. Maybe an emergency happens and you realize that your plan is not robust enough. OK, we got to quickly throw something together. The document is broken up in such a way where you can identify the section that you need pretty quickly, mm -hmm. Absolutely. be able to yeah. ref reference it and all that. And, and we're working on something, actually, it's happening in the room right next door, not too far, and Tim just left that meeting. Correct. Um, yeah. So he's actually, you know, not doing what he should be doing today. But no, just <laughs> Don't kidding. tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but there, we're actually me. working on yeah, a guidance go. document for end users and facilities to teach them how now to use the document, because the standard's out. Right. And sometimes it can be very confusing and daunting and, and scary, honestly, to go, how do I interpret this? How do I use it? Or sometimes it could be like everybody else is coming down and said, this is how you should use it. Now we're following on with an implementation or uh, guideline or TIR again for this. So that's Correct. what he's actually working on today. Oh, and I, I think it's important too, because um, in this SPD world, we have our uh, fun times with our facilities teams in regards to how they should manage the water. Mm -hmm. And without this document, you know, they were kind of like that subject matter expert and hey, no, we know what we're doing. This is how we're doing. Now we have a document that we can say, hey, here's the outline of what we're doing and, and as we're working on this new TIR, here is how we're supposed to implement it. So that's really gonna, again, give us that voice and, and uh, direction. And this is backed up by that data, that rigorous science. You know, you've mm -hmm. got scientists in the room. Correct. Evidence-based, yeah. It, and we were just joking before we went live, but yeah, it's funny, you put a bunch of PhDs in a room that are really smart and it's funny how they're almost like <laughs> surgeons. When, when you say, okay, isn't it, there's, there's one way to do surgery? No, there's a lot of way to do surgeries. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to look at the data, but that's why it's important to have that vast knowledge of these really these experts to almost 
I don't want to say argue, but debate. 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 Debate's, debate. Better, Debate's yeah, a good like word. It. And, and right. we're sitting back there going, well, just finish your debate, and I'll tell you <laughs> what I do. So it's really good. I think the other important part about the document, which, which I want to call out, is not only did we say buy the document, read the document, but also most large facilities have a water management plan already in place. Mm-hmm. Right. They have to for, for, for multitude of reasons. It's, it's usually a state requirement. Now this will help you join it. You don't have to create a new committee. Right. In your hospital, say, I want something special for sterile processing. This is just going to be a subset of an existing committee. And you work with your infection preventionists. You work with your facilities team. You work with your biomed maintenance. You work with the local water experts. All these people are outlined in the document. Yeah. And then the, the thing that we talked about started off was emergencies. Emergencies don't know when they happen. So you don't want to try to invent what you're doing and break out ST-108 when there's a disaster and say, what am I going to do? Try to figure it out then. You, sure, you yeah. come up with your plan prior. But right. if you don't have a water management system in your facility this is also will help you start that conversation interesting hey you know what it's been really good talking to you both uh i'm looking forward to the rest of the week absolutely uh, this should be good all right thank you uh thank you tim you're the one out there doing the work so i appreciate you awesome